Welcome to The Voice of Russia. I'm uh, Katerina Grachov in our Moscow studio, and it's time now for our weekly international panel discussion where we link up with our studios in Washington, D.C. and in London. Well, the topic of uh, today's discussion is 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics uh, attempts to fight back boycott plans. Well, the very latest has been that the White House has canceled Barack Obama's scheduled visit and meeting with the Russian President Vladimir Putin, uh, which is due to take place uh, in uh, less than a month from now, before the G20 summit takes place in St. Petersburg. Uh, some voices, including South Carolina Republican um, Senator Lindsey Graham and actor and writer Stephen Fry, uh, among others, are calling for a more dramatic rebuke, like uh, U.S. boycott of next year's uh, Winter Olympic Games in Sochi. I know athletes would be heartbroken, Graham told journalists, I love the Olympics, but I hate what Russia is doing throughout the world. Well, there are two reasons which are widely believed to be behind those calls for boycotting the Games, and these are uh, Russia offering, uh, uh, granting a temporary asylum to Edward Snowden, and the second one is Russia adopting a law which is aimed against gay propaganda aimed at minors. Well, to discuss these calls for boycotting the games, I'm joined here in the Moscow studio uh, by John Halevik, managing partner at Awara Group. Uh, and uh, on the phone, we have uh, Martin Andrews, RTTV anchor and roving reporter. Also in the studio, we have Dmitry Babich, uh, voice of Russia political commentator. In London, we have John Goodbody, the Sunday uh, Times sports correspondent. John has covered the last 12 Summer Olympic Games. He's also the author of the audiobook, The um, the History of the Olympics, and he's also a sports reporter of the year of 2001. Thank you very much for joining this discussion, taking part in our discussion panel uh, from Washington uh, will be Akil Patterson, a member of the Athlete Ally Advisory Board. For many years, Akil wouldn't tell the world who he really was, a gay athlete, uh, a gay man playing in the first division of uh, his college football team. How opening up to the world has changed his career and has changed people's attitude? Uh, we would address uh, this question later to him in the program. So hello, gentlemen. Thank you very much for uh, joining uh, our discussion. Well, first of all, I would like to ask our Moscow studio guest, uh, John Halvik, how realistic is these, uh, are these boycott calls in the first place? What is your take on that? Oh, of course, they are uh, fortunately very unrealistic. There is no chance that there will be uh, any boycott. It's, Why do you think so? There is just not... Uh, first of all, too much time. Well, and there are limits uh, how far the international propaganda can go, how far the means can, can go. Now, uh, evidently, there is a campaign going on, but uh, the topic is a little, uh, is anyway too small that you could uh, engage the whole Olympic community to this. Nitrin, what do you think? Is the boycott call Realistic? Well, I think uh, that they are not very realistic, although there will be a lot of noise, of course, uh, because uh, this campaign uh, has been sort of strange. You know, this law on shielding minors from gay, gay propaganda in Russia, it was adopted uh, in late June. So for a whole month, this law was criticized by foreign media and by some media in Russia, but there was no linkage made uh, with the Olympic Games. And then suddenly, in the end of July, in the first days of August, obviously someone very important in Washington, I don't know where, uh, made this linkage, connected the dots. And suddenly all newspapers started writing about these Olympic Games only almost exclusively in the context of uh, this new legislation. And I think now Russia still has some time to show that there is a gay community in Russia, that gay activity is not criminalized. It has been decriminalized since 1993, and in fact, even before, since Gorbachev came to power in mid-80s, the old Soviet uh, article in the criminal code has not been really enforced. So when the world is going to see that, I think uh, there will be little ground for calls for boycott. But of course, right now, when there is little information, and there is a lot of misinformation, there is a lot of hue and cry, you know, around this issue. 
uh, there is a certain nervousness and there is a certain danger. I hope uh, that uh, these uh, Olympic Games will not be boycotted because we already had two boycotts in uh, Olympic history in Moscow in 1980 because of Afghanistan. Then Moscow reiterated by boycotting the Games in 1984 in Los Angeles. And these were tragedies real tragedies for athletes, because athletes usually participate uh, and have a chance to win only in one or two games. Of well, course, their professional most. career is very short. We'll be getting back to that. But before we get to uh, the point of for athletes uh, deciding not to, to participate in the Olympic Games or to what that means for an athlete to uh, stay away from such an international competition as an as Olympic Games. I would like to ask Martin Andrews, who's on the phone with us from Moscow. Uh, you're not a sportsman, but you're a journalist, and you are just back from Sochi, where you've been filming a documentary uh, on how Sochi is preparing for the Winter Olympic Games in less than half a year from now. I would like to ask you, what does it feel like to live in a country and being a gay man in a country where 80 percent, 88, sorry, percent of Russians are opposed to the idea of gay love. Is it hard? Well, I don't think it's hard. No, I'm from myself. I'm from Liverpool. So I'm from the north of England. So I, I too, I know what it's like to be in, in a community where homosexual culture isn't accepted. But of course, I'm talking about my, my childhood, which was 20 years ago. I think there's a whole difference between uh, people opposing uh, uh, gay culture and, and education. And I just think that, that having traveled through 75 cities in Russia with my travel show that I did over, the, over five years ago, it's simply about education. As you said, I'm a journalist here in Moscow. Um, I filmed dozens, if not hundreds, of, of, uh, of culture shows on nightlife in Moscow, on, on, on restaurants in Moscow. Every single person, I do not hide my sexuality from, from anybody. Uh, and in some ways, uh, that's very different to many uh, Russian guys my age. And actually, if you, um, if you stand up and you're proud and loud without being too in your face and too flamboyant, actually, people realize that you're just a human being and you're just a person. Uh, and so, therefore, it's just about education. Uh, Sochi, when I was filming there last week, um, there was obviously... There were, there were no riots on the street. There was no tension. There is nothing but mass hysteria at the moment uh, coming from America and coming from, uh, from the UK, being more specific about that, from London and New York and, and L.A. Um, and you can't compare, you know, a city in the middle of America to New York as you can't compare Liverpool to, to London. What would you respond to Stephen Fry, who is calling, athletes, uh, calling on athletes to boycott uh Sochi Winter Olympics. What would be your response? Well, I, I think that Stephen Fry's message is is wrong. Um, I think first of all he should talk about other countries because there are 70 other countries in this world where it is illegal uh, and where uh, you know being a homosexual is uh, punishable by death. So I think that it's very interesting that Qatar, which has the World Cup, doesn't seem to be mentioned. Now, I personally think that's because, actually, we're talking about soccer. We're talking about football, which, in fact, even in the UK, is homophobic in itself. And there seems to be so much anti-Russia propaganda coming from, from the West. Uh, I, for one, as, as, as a gay man here in Moscow, do not like the new laws. They are, they are statistically, and they, they are wrong, and they shouldn't be in place. Uh, that said, uh, it's also very, very important to point out Section 28, which Margaret Thatcher brought in in 1988, which was a similar law in the fact that they wanted to uh, protect children and protect minors and not educate children in schools about uh, LGBT communities. Um, and actually, even though the law was put in place over the past 20, 30 years, as we've seen the progression, the gay communities in the UK have come on leaps and bounds to the gay marriage that we're talking about today. So actually, just because a law is put into place doesn't mean it filters down to reality. Uh, and I, for one, will tell anybody that uh, no foreigners will be arrested for simply walking the streets if they're gay. That's just not going to happen. Rules in Russia, we know what it's like. It doesn't always come into place in reality. The smoking ban was put, brought in last month. People are still smoking by the metro exit. 
Well, and now to sportsmen. Well, the active age of every sportsman is indeed very short not to participate in the games. What does this mean for a professional? I would like to ask uh, Ekil Patterson in Washington. If you were to take part in these Olympic Games, would you rather go there or boycott the games as a gay man? Well, for many athletes, the year 2014 uh, Winter Olympics, like any Olympic Games, is a chance to market themselves, to present themselves to the public, uh, well, let alone set themselves up for whatever comes after retirement. So, Echo, would you go or not? Um, uh, I definitely would go. I, I don't think there's an athlete in the world that wouldn't go to the Olympic Games. We must first understand that an athlete, gay, straight, bi, transgender, or whatever, is still an athlete. And their families have sacrificed for 10, 15, 20 years to make this dream come true. And that is what we're you know, saying, that an athlete deserves the right to walk out on, uh, onto the biggest stage in the world. And remember, for those of us who are true amateur athletes, not the NBA players or the baseball players or the, 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 the FIFA world team soccer players who will make $100,000 per game, but for the true amateur who does ice luge and spends, you know, hours on end waking up early in the morning to make sure they hit the ice at the perfect time. Or for the kid who uh, wakes up in the middle of uh, uh, the northern uh, part of Russia or in the northern part of Minnesota who gets on the ice to, to ice skate because it's all he can afford. Those are the individuals that, that we fight for. And rather they're gay or straight, they deserve the right to walk out and be part of the Olympic Games. And the IOC's uh, lack of support on this, this whole situation is really disheartening. The IOC really needs to take a look at actually basic human rights in a country when they make their decisions because that's going to affect how the athletes coming in will be treated. Well, may I ask you, Akil, how do you understand what has been dubbed by many in the West as uh, Russia's anti-gay law? Um, well, by what I've read, um, this whole thing really didn't start with anybody in the West uh, inferring anything. It was the minister of sports there in Russia making a comment um, again that necessarily the translation may have been off, but basically said... If you come to Russia, our laws will be enforced, and this is one of our laws. It is a gay, anti-gay law against propaganda. So meaning if I have a flag or a patch or something that represents, quote-unquote, gayness, then I will be deemed as breaking the law. Now, that, that is the, the, the small end of it. But remember, most people don't read all 300 pages of anything. I mean, we have a health care healthcare care bill in this country that most people are like, I only read this much of it. Our attention spans are very small. So therefore, if well, I'm not going to read all 300 well, pages. May, maybe this is the whole point. Maybe we should start, indeed, our discussion by understanding what this uh, legislation, new law, aimed against, uh, anti, uh, aimed against propaganda, aimed at minors, is all about. What the is law is not about minors? punishing people. We will get to that. Our, our Moscow studio guests would want to comment on that. Uh, the law is not about punishing people for being homosexual, but rather it intends to keep minors from being influenced by non-traditional sexual relationship propaganda, mostly, of course, through Internet, and it will be enforced with fines, but not criminal punishment. This is very important. It, uh, let, let's say this is an extract of mm -hmm. what uh, Russian uh, MPs uh, say about the law. I would like... Uh, Dmitry Babich, and I would like uh, John to uh, tell us from our Moscow studio what the law is really about. What, what, what are we talking about? Is it what? really aimed at people who come out with a rainbow flag? They might be jailed. Well, since uh, John was involved in preparation of the Olympics, I'll leave the details of the law to him, but I think I understand why uh, um, Mr. Patterson is so concerned uh, about this uh, situation, because if you read the Western newspapers, they exaggerate uh, what happened, uh, and they present this law in, in a distorted way. Before we go to London, uh, uh, to a journalist in London, I would like to quote uh, an article in the New York Times uh, about this new law. The article says, the law prohibits 
it bans all talk of homosexuality or, or for that matter, of any sexuality uh, on the, or in the air, <clears throat> any kind of sexuality the Russian authorities deem non-traditional. Well, that's simply not true, because if it had been true, we would not be sitting here already, because we would be breaking the law by talking about homosexuality here. So this is the problem with Western journalists. They always uh, dramatize uh, anything that happens in Russia. And uh, maybe it's a topic for discussion with London. The, the line between journalism and show business is getting dangerously blurred now. Uh, journalists sometimes write what their editors and what their auditor, uh, audience expects from them. And unfortunately, from Russia, the, audi the audience expects negative news. It expects uh, some kind of a repetition of Soviet experience, you know, cracking down on gays and other things. And this is simply not true. But maybe John will tell us about that law in yes, greater John, detail. John, tell us indeed. Uh, first of all, uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, his uh, representatives have already uh, made it clear that the law would not be imposed upon athletes or fans coming to participate in the Winter Olympics. But I'm also trying to understand as well, uh, what does this law is aimed at? Mm -hmm. Does this mean that if I go out with a rainbow flag, uh, I might be prosecuted, put in, into jail, or uh, what, can I be fined? Or this is only aimed at people who are uh, propagandizing uh, gay lifestyle. Gay lifestyle, children, yes. yes. Uh, uh, propagandizing my, among minors on the internet or elsewhere. Okay. To know uh, for the background where I'm coming from, uh, I'm not uh, a supporter of this law. I think it's uh, it's not a good. Uh, uh, it's, it's a misconceived uh, uh, law. But it's actually a very minor issue. That's uh, uh, I, I could talk with my lawyer friends about the nuances of the law. But it's uh, it's it, the law has nothing to do with those things that the Western press uh, is now writing about. So uh, I really see that this is some kind of a campaign, and this law has been chosen as the campaign uh, flag, mm -hmm. because uh, the law uh, really uh, first of all Russia is a very tolerant uh, country. There is no uh, discrimination uh, against uh, gays uh, here. There are in Moscow uh, several uh, gay clubs where, which... And in Sochi as well. Uh, One uh, has just been opened. Yeah, so uh, I, I think I actually Russians are even more tolerant in this respect than, than many uh, European people. So uh, there is no legal uh, discrimination at all. What the law is about, it says uh, that propaganda directed to minors uh, in uh, propaganda in encouraging uh, 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 non-traditional uh, sexual uh, relations, that's for prohibited. First of all, it says propaganda and dissem disseminating information. So uh, it really is a question of prohibiting something which is propaganda, not what you say or your opinions, but something that is done in, in let's say, propaganda is always a conspiracy. It's an unfair information. Yes, yes. actually, we know what propaganda is. Propaganda is what uh, the Western press is now doing with this uh, so-called uh, gay ban in, in Russia, because there is nothing. So, okay, you are not allowed to be in a conspiracy to disseminate information to uh, promote uh, non-traditional uh, uh, sexual relations. If any athlete is planning to come to Sochi to do it, that would be very strange. I think they come to so uh, Sochi to uh, do their sports. Mm -hmm. Echo, uh, what is your take on that? After all, it doesn't seem like it's that bad to adopt a legislation which would be aimed against uh, minors being involved in, uh, uh, I don't know, semi-sex marriages, uh, well, semi-sex relationship. I, because, of course, we all understand that people are born, they do not choose. This is not their choice, right? You're well, born gay. Well, yeah, so you I, cannot I, I, deny definitely. the fact that many minors, teenagers, they might also uh, be turned gays. Do you accept that fact? How would you comment on that? I don't. I don't. I don't think anybody's out there recruiting anybody. I tell you that from the from the the bottom of my heart. I don't, 
If anything, I'm not recruiting anyone to be gay. If anything, I'll tell a kid, I was like, I hope I have nieces and nephews. I have children. I have my, my nieces and my nephews are my brother's children. Um, they come around me. They've been around my partner. They've also worked out in my wrestling gym. They know the type of individual that I am. And then all the kids that I've worked with all across the years have, most of them aren't gay. Most of them go on to marry girls. Most of them are very well and intelligent young men and women. The same point goes for many other. Now, are there, are there people out there that are going to do evil and disgusting things to children? I'm sure there are. I'm sure there's people that have always been that way. And that is not what this is, issue is about. This issue is about now you're saying that I can't put, pass out information to help someone not kill themselves. Many LGBT, that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals have a higher rate of suicide than almost any part of the population. Now, what I would like to do is just say, hey, if you're going through X, Y, and Z, there are support services for you to give you help. That's how we talk about education. We talk about educating those who are not aware. And the homosexual gay lifestyle that you refer to isn't a lifestyle that a lot of people will talk about but also something that I'm sure that many of you may not be totally aware of, that there are differences. And this, like, like you having now. a family, like mm-hmm. everyone else, and everyone around me has a family, we have done a great job here in the States promoting positive imagery. But yet what continues to happen on a global stance is people have very narrow images that they can refer to. So when they think of homosexual, they think of this one image. They don't think of a six foot four black man such as myself that played college football. That was a two time all American that wrestles. And matter of fact, I my one of my heroes who I think he got robbed in the 2000 Olympics is Alexander Kruelin, who is now in the parliament, who I actually got to meet one time. Who's a hero of mine? And uh, there's, there, there's been many Rush. The Russian national team came here this year for a rumble on the rails, and they also wrestled over in Los Angeles that I got to talk to and meet. And you know what? I didn't bring up my sexuality to them, but I brought up that I believe that they were great athletes. And so that's the most important thing is that we talk to one another as human beings. And that wrestling continues to you know, be this thriving and community sport that we long for. But it has nothing to do with sexuality and that we must pass out and disseminate proper information about homosexuality and not demonize it. And that's what happens with this law is it it makes it look like it's demonized. Well, let's now cross uh, to London, uh, where I would like to ask uh, John Goodbody, the Sunday Times uh, sports correspondent. How do you interpret this law? Well, I interpret this law uh, as not really being against the Olympic Charter um, uh, in which there is a clear message that there should be uh, no discrimination. Um, I do feel, uh, however, that uh, you've got to correct one or two things that were said earlier. One of them, of course, is there have been several boycotts of the Olympic Games. Uh, I do not think, incidentally, that there will be a boycott of these Olympic Games, by certainly by countries, but we have had... Um, apart from the 1980 and 84 games, we had a boycott of the 76 games by black African countries because of New Zealand sporting links with uh, South Africa, which were then under the apartheid regime. And uh, I think it is important to realise that, in fact, that boycott uh, only took place two days before the Olympic Games were due to open in Montreal, which was where I was at the time. Um, so I think that is uh, an important uh, thing to bear in mind. These boycotts can spring up at the last moment. Um, do I think, uh, as I said, that these games are going to be a subject of a boycott? No, I don't, um, because I don't think there will be sufficient momentum behind it But it is worth looking back uh, to the 1936 Olympics, which were staged in Germany, when, uh, of course, Germany then under Nazi rule, we had a situation where the United States nearly didn't go to those games. And in retrospect, you have to look back and say to yourself, would it have been a, a, a 
practical idea? And secondly, was it a moral idea for the United States and other countries to have boycotted those 1936 games? Thank you very much. This is our weekly international panel discussion where we link up with our studios in Washington and uh, D.C. and in London. And today's topic is 2014 Sochi Olympics, fighting back boycott plans. We'll be back in a couple of minutes after the news update. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking about uh, 2014 Winter Olympic Games in Sochi fighting back boycott plans. Well, our guests today are John Halovic, managing partner at Awara Group in our Moscow studio, Dmitry Babich, the voice of Russia political commentator. On the phone with us is uh, RT TV anchor Martin Andrews. In London, we have John Goodbody today, Sunday Times sports correspondent, and in Washington, Akil Patterson, a member of the Athlete Ally Advisory Board. Well, we broke up at the point when we were talking about the history of boycotts, uh, of boycotting Olympic Games. So the U.S. Olympic Committee uh, ignored this offer to skip the uh, Sochi Olympics proposed by U.S. Senator uh, Lindsey Graham. A representative of the Olympic Committee said, if there are any lessons to be learned from the American boycott of 1980, is that uh, Olympic boycotts do not work. Well, just a reminder, U.S. Olympic team did not take part in uh, uh, the 1980 Moscow Olympic Games uh, in protest of Soviet Union's invasion in Afghanistan. In two years uh, from that, uh, in response, USSR uh, boycotted 1948-84 sorry, games in Los Angeles. I would like to ask uh, our London guest, uh, John Goodbody. John, what is the lesson to be drawn from those boycotts? Well, the lesson to be drawn from those boycotts is they don't usually work, um, except that you have to remember that uh, um, uh, there was an international uh, clampdown on South Africa competing in uh, any Olympic Games between uh, 1964 and 1992. Uh, they were refused entry to the Games, and people could argue that the collapse of the apartheid regime in South Africa was partly due to that, to that boycott of, uh, to that uh, ban on South African international teams taking part in the Olympic Games and a lot of other sports as well. I think there is, though, a question here which is important, and that is, firstly, does it work? And the answer is usually it doesn't. And clearly we saw that from 80 and 84. But there is also the question in general of boycotts that if it's about human rights, and I put, go back to the 1936 Olympics here with the uh, Nazi uh, attitude and, of course, eventual annihilation as far as they could do of Jewish people in, um, in Germany and other countries... Should people take an individual stand here on a moral ground that here is a human rights issue and should we therefore take action on that basis? Now, I'm not saying that here, in this case of Sochi, there is a violation of human rights, but it's an interesting point. At what stage should you do something for human rights rather than as occurred in 1980 and 84 when it was clearly a political boycott. I would like to ask Dmitry Babich, how do you see these calls for boycotting uh, Sochi Olympics? Uh, a political move or rather a uh, uh, move to help human rights activists working here in Russia? Well, I'm afraid this time it's mostly political uh, because... Uh, Let's look at the history, how it all developed. First, there was an attempt uh, to connect uh, the games to the uh, conflict between Russia and Georgia in 2008. Uh, then uh, suddenly some people found in the old books that some of the uh, ethnic minorities of southern Russia who lived uh, in that area in Sochi, they were forcefully removed back in the 19th century. So it's another issue. It didn't work, you know. Uh, Russia is now improving its relations with Georgia and this, uh, you know, wild card with the ethnic minorities also didn't work because uh, most of them are not against the games there. Uh, actually, these ethnic minorities now living there, they plan to profit from these games. 
And uh, coming back to what uh, John Goodbody, you know, the, the example that he cited in 1936, what I would like to note is that the United States finally didn't boycott these games, and it was right, because the successes of black athletes from the United States and other countries made a mockery of Hitler's ideas of racial superiority of whites. You know, the famous story when uh, a sprint runner from the United States, Jace Owens, won the race, beating uh, white athletes. It was such a humiliation to Hitler, you know, because Hitler certainly didn't expect that to happen, uh, that I think uh, in 1936 the decision to go uh, to the uh, Olympic Games was the right one, and history has shown it to be the right one. Uh, in general, even when you talk about human rights, I'm not sure that Olympic Games are exactly the best place uh, where you can fight uh, for uh, seemingly noble causes. Uh, because uh, this is uh, about sports, this is about uniting people, this is about making them equal, you know, because sports is after all also about equality. So I think uh, the best way to fight for human rights is to give equal chances to the athletes and to see which one of them do better. And, uh, you know, I certainly don't like uh, the fact that sometimes um, these games are being used politically, even for patriotic purposes. I mean, we still remember that famous hockey game between Russia and the United States in 1980. Uh, and unfortunately, it was played politically in the Soviet Union and in the United States. It was like communism versus capitalism. And I think it's sad because it was just a beautiful game. And it's very good that some of the Soviet players later played in the capitalistic United States uh, uh, in the 90s. So I think that uh, uh, even now, if these games is used for some kind of uh, uh, gay action, I'm not sure that this is going to be a good effect. Uh, this is going to have a good effect in Russia because sports is about sports. And it, it's about some kind of noble attitude to everyone. So uh, I hope that uh, there will be no provocations at these games. John, who do you think benefits from such calls for boycotts? I've, I've seen in this connection and in, in many others already, uh, 10 years I've been uh, looking at these uh, things very um, carefully, that there, is, uh, there are frequently uh, campaigns, uh, propaganda campaigns against Russia. Uh, uh, the Western press, uh, mainstream Western press, is usually engaged in this, and uh, they get uh, support or directions from uh, from their governments. And uh, they always choose one theme. So uh, they look what would be uh, Russia vulnerable for for now. Okay, now it's the Olympics. They will uh, a long time looking for what to do about the Olympics, so what would be uh, the, the perfect propaganda uh, thing about it. They uh, try to elevate the corruption, uh, alleged uh, corruption things, but that didn't fly. And somebody said, hey, let's connect this uh, uh, supposed uh, gay discrimination uh, to it. But as I said, there is no discrimination. I may add, uh, there is not even a jail sentence. There's a fine. It's, it's not even a crime. It's an administrative offense. So uh, who's benefiting? Uh, the propaganda machine which is uh, doing this anti-Russia propaganda, they are always benefiting because uh, people will uh, will believe that there is something wrong in, uh, in, in Russia. I would like to add therefore that uh, uh, it's very dangerous for us to <coughs> discuss any parallels with uh, boycotts of Hitler's Olympics or something like that, because uh, it puts us as if we were compared, as, as if uh, we would agree that we are on the same line. There's nothing like that. There are no uh, human rights violations in, uh, in, in Russia, at least uh, not anything that uh, the government is uh, sponsoring. Uh, on the contrary, the Russian government uh, uh, and the president is doing all they can uh, to improve uh, situations in, in, in human rights in, in all aspects of, uh, of Russia. The only parallel we can make with uh, Hitler's Olympics is uh, the propaganda, because it, uh, this Western propaganda directed against Russia and the Olympics it reminds me of uh, Goebbels' uh, propaganda. I would like to ask Mr. Goodbody, if uh, this is not political this time around, 
Why is there an impression that uh, so many things get mixed up in one? Like, they fall into one blender. Uh, Edward Snowden's case, uh, getting a temporary asylum in Russia, also um, uh, calls to uh, stop drinking Russian vodka, vodka which goes down the drains in New York in protest over new Russian laws, which many describe as anti-gay uh, laws. Plus, Putin has also recently approved a law making foreign uh, uh, same-sex couples ineligible of uh, to adopt Russian children. And all this together, and uh, as a result of that, people are boycotting. In one case, uh, we have... a. Uh, in a way, a boycott which has already happened. The White House has announced that Barack Obama is not going to meet with Vladimir Putin as it had been scheduled in in a month from now. Now we have uh, calls of uh, senators to boycott Olympic Games. There is an impression that all this is political. Well, uh, I would think that the case of Edward Snowden is quite clearly a political uh, call for a boycott. I mean, there doesn't seem any argument about that. It's not a human rights issue. Whether uh, I, I do not think that um, the human rights of uh, gay people are being discriminated against on a s severe scale... Uh, in in Russia as out of this law, um, but it is uh, on in many other occasions of boycotts a very difficult line of where the political ends and the human rights begins because obviously politics are to do with human rights uh, and therefore it's quite difficult to separate the two. I would like to ask Martin Andrews. Uh, I hope he is still on the phone there with us. Martin, don't you think that Stephen Fry, in the case of uh, the Sochi Olympic Games, found a cheap way to promote himself as a human rights activist? I think that Stephen Fry should actually realistically know what life is like here in Russia. I think people boycotting uh, Russian vodka, for example, around the world is just ridiculous. If you're going down that route, you might as well uh, boycott oil from Saudi. You might as well boycott bananas. You might as well uh, boycott coffee from Starbucks. Uh, people really need to look at, at the life here uh, and realize that um, actually there is a thriving gay community here in Moscow and St. Petersburg and in fact in various cities around Russia. Uh, it's just that uh, it's, it's, it's not forced or thrust into your faces uh, like it is in other countries. Not that that is a bad thing and I think that will come into play in Russia. Lots of people have asked me about the gay parade and the situation on the gay parades in Moscow. I actually think in my experience that um, they should be banned. Uh, my, my opinion on that is very controversial. Uh, why? Well, that I think that um, the fact that the, the church really um, is a strong hold on society here, much more than it is in, in Britain. I think that if anybody is going to parade uh, straight away, they will alienate themselves and the communities they represent. Also, at the same time, um, you will have angry babushkas who will never understand new contemporary lifestyles. Uh, but in 30 years' time, uh, the babushkas won't exist. Uh, and let's hope that in 30 years' time, uh, these ridiculous laws um, with escape propaganda also won't exist. But is this, in your view, a reflection of the attitude of the majority of Russians still? Or it's just a harsh homophobic stance of Vladimir Putin and uh, personally and his team, probably, as many see it. Well, first of all, um, you can't just say that. What, I mean, who is a Russian person? Because a Moscovite, you can't compare a Moscovite to somebody who lives in Omsk or, or Tomsk. Well, let's uh, say, comes, let's say the majority, Putin, let's say saying, the majority, you know, polls show that 80 percent of Russians are opposed to the idea of gay love. Right. But also when it comes to you saying that Putin is, is, is homophobic, why then, for example, was there a, a, a new, gigantic, huge new gay club opened in Moscow two weeks ago? If, if the Russian government, not that I'm, I'm supporting their new laws, but if the Russian government was that homophobic, that club, like uh, clubs in the Middle East, for example, would not be allowed to, to, to be opened. Um, so I actually think uh, with their strong family values, I think the homophobia comes through uh, 
uh, lack of education. And I think the homophobia with, with the new laws actually doesn't um, single out the gay communities, but it's more the, the, the support behind children. Because at the end of the day, and I know this as a, as a gay man, uh, gay images or, or anything when it comes to that, does, uh, they, they are sexual. Uh, and I, so I, in many ways, I don't have a problem with children being protected from that. Uh, that said, uh, your guest earlier said that if there's a, a, a gay child or a young teenager who is possibly suicidal, the fact that they legally can't be helped, then that's where the problems come into, into force. Well, I would like to quote uh, Johnny Weir, who is gay figure skater and a uh, hardcore Russophile, as he himself uh, describes himself. He says that there are any lessons to be learned from the American boycott of 1980s that the Olympic boycotts do not work. Uh, it did, however, deprive hundreds of American athletes of the opportunity of a lifetime. And on the flip side, he also believes that to help the local LGBT community in Russia, um, you have to be on the ground in Russia, sitting on the Russian soil and sending a message from out here. Akil, w what do you think? What message could uh, the LGBT uh, gay community send uh, uh, from being here in the Sochi Olympics? to the world to call for tolerance, for more understanding of people who are gay? Uh, um, my feeling is that um, I, I just, your other guest, is he might live in the ground in Russia, but I, I think I, just a comment is that gay images aren't sexual in nature. Let's just say that because you know what? I'm a gay image. I have friends that are gay images and we walk down the street, we go to work, we, we put on our shoes one at a time. We go to the bar, we grab a beer. You know, those are gay images if you really want to get down to the nitty gritty. So I'm, I'm actually offended by them saying that gay images are sexual. I don't have sexual gay images where me, my shirt off, okay? I'm a fat guy. I don't like my shirt off. That's the truth. So that, that, that needs to be squashed. And the fact that that is the imagery that people have in their minds is very disrespectful. Saying that gay is this. Gay is not just one-sided. And the way we change that is by being on the ground, that we show our affection for our loved ones. If someone wins an Olympic gold medal, why can't they go over there and hug and kiss the person they're married to or they're with? See, here in the United States, and I, and I know internationally we, ha we, we have difficulties because of cultural aspects, and that's fine. But homosexuality isn't a cultural thing. It's a human thing. And, we, and, we make, and uh... the way we get over these things is that we start to promote positive imagery and that we are very focused. And Athlete Ally is very focused in helping people get there by having the ally support where we have our friends and our family members who know us to actually rise to raise us up and speak with us. And be there for us. And that's what we're going to do over there when we come to Winter Games. We're going to be there to support one another. Applaud when they win. Applaud when they fall. And be there to make sure that they know that they are victorious in every sense of the word. Again and again, Mitra, we're <laughs> getting to the point where we're trying to uh, set a line between mm -hmm. just being gay mm -hmm. and living a life, having lifestyle like everyone else in this country. Martin Andrews again and again repeats that he doesn't feel being uh, deprived of any opportunities living in this country. There are gay clubs opening up, people at toll rent. And uh, he made a very good parallel that New York is not the same as Texas. So, too, Moscow is not the same as a remote village yeah. uh, somewhere on the outskirts. Um, so, of course, we all Moscovites here, we see a lot of gay people around. We don't see them having any problems whatsoever. But what people in the West are wondering about, and this can be understood if, uh, if there are misinterpretations of this law in the Western press, they're wondering, can U.S. figure skater uh, Johnny Weir, 2014 uh, medal hopeful, uh, be punished, uh, uh, sent to jail for giving a pack to his husband? No, I think that uh, nothing like that will happen. And I think the organizers of this campaign know very well that this won't happen. Actually, uh, if uh, you asked John, you know, who profits from this campaign? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you, uh, even if there is no money involved, it's a very cheap way to present yourself something that you are not, to pose as a human rights activist without risking 
you know, you don't risk challenging the U.S. government about its surveillance programs. You don't risk uh, uh, fighting for workers' rights. You fight some distant uh, hostile government in Russia, which is supposedly breaking human rights. That's a very safe and cheap way to present yourself uh, as, a, uh, as an idealist and as a human rights campaigner. We have gone through this with Bernard-Henri Lévy uh, and his campaign uh, for, the, um, you know, for the crushing of the Libyan regime. We have gone through this uh, through lots of campaigns about Afghanistan in the 80s. Uh, and, uh, you know, the problem is that these people are simply not sincere. And here, again, I agree with John. Look... Uh, uh, this is not eternal fight for human rights because fight for human rights is eternal. You, f you do it uh, one year, you do it next year. And these campaigns, they change every month. John has noted it very well. Since uh, Vladimir Putin returned to power last year after the presidential election, every month there was a new campaign. First, there was this statement by Mrs. Clinton, that the election wasn't fair. Then there was the Magnitsky Act. Then there was this NGO law. Uh, I agree that some of these problems were created by uh, sometimes not very thought well uh, laws or some government actions here. But all of them were blown out of proportion and misrepresented in the Western media. And uh, answering what uh, Martin Andrews said about babushkas, you know, we should not forget, uh, you know, this very phenomenon of babushka. Where, it, where did it come from? Well, it's very easy. A lot of men died during the Second World War and millions of women in Russia had no chance, no opportunity to get married. So you have this generation of old women who have never known love, a lot of them in their life. Be tolerant with them, even if they sometimes have their views on sexuality and on other things, even sometimes, if sometimes they express these views rudely, know their history and be tolerant with them. Yes, there is a well-known proverb that for 10 men in Russia, there are only... For, for 10 women in Russia, there are only nine men. Though well, I'm afraid our after the second situation World War, is even worse right after now. After the Second World War, there were uh, about five women for every man in the country. So are we on topic here, Because even. I, I, so I just many asked, people died during the war. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that there was a there are atrocities that have happened across our time span. Trust me, sir. Um, as a black American, I, I understand those. And as a black American, male American living in the gay lifestyle, as some of you have said it, uh, we have also had atrocities. And we, my, right now, currently, the African-American community here in the United States faces the highest growing rate of HIV and AIDS. And it's not the gay people that are actually infected. It's the heterosexual community. But yet we have an a, a, a opportunity to be a civil rights activist. And, and when you say you people are... are, are you know, flash in the pan, civil rights activists. I'll say this. I'm an athlete first and foremost. My number one job was to train for the 2012 Olympics. And because I'm in a sport that only takes one athlete per weight class, once you qualify, I finish number five, and that's not good enough in my sport. And I understand that, and it sucks. But I live with it. But now I go back and I train others. But we are activists in our daily lives. We live this lifestyle. Athlete Ally, we are committed to making sure and eradicating homophobia and transphobia in sports. And that comes with raising our voices and raising awareness. So this has nothing to do about a flash in a pan, fly-by-night movement, sir. This is about life. This is about real human life. Dignity. And if I was called queer in Russia or I was called a faggot in Russia because of my sexual orientation, not because of my athletic performance, but because of my sexual orientation in terms of who I, I love, that would be detrimental to my athletic performance as it is to every athlete who has to go out and perform. So, again, this has nothing to do. Take the media out of it. Take the press away. Yeah. We're only reason well, we're talking I can about this because you won't be called these names in Russia. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, well, there probably there's a, there's probably a, a, you know, it's like being called a poof over in London. I mean, it, it's the same thing. You got a word for it. Somebody's going to call you it. What I'm saying is, is that we wouldn't be talking about this if it wasn't for the media. Now, I'm happy for the media to talk about it, but ultimately, I want this not to be an issue. I want this to be, hey, he's gay. He's got somebody kissed in the stands. 
moving on with our lives. That's what we want. We want this issue to be dead eventually and that it would not affect people. And to say that homosexuality is promoting propaganda, which I come back to, is not the case. So in 1936, Jesse Owens did win the track race. In 1968, two men, two black men, put up a power to the people sign. They were stripped of their Olympic gold medals, eventually given back. Jim Thorpe, a Native American, was stripped of his Olympic gold medals. Why? Because he was a Native American. Jesse Owens kept his because he put us on the map. And the two black men were stripped of his. Why? Because they did something that was against policy. Too long, too often is this country or our countries divided. And for two weeks, we've asked Two weeks we've asked that we put aside all of our crap to actually elevate the voices and the actual athletic community. We elevate those people. But instead, we're back to politics as usual. We have to stop with the politics, stop with the rhetoric, and start talking about human dignity. This is about the athletes, not about you and I and how much we can bicker. Let's get those guys back up to where they need to be. Let's tell our governments to stay out of it for two weeks, just for two weeks, two weeks. Stay out of it. Stop. Put, stop saying these crazy laws and things of that nature. When you clearly know that somebody's going to challenge you on them, they're going to get challenged by somebody. So that's who the real people are. Our politicians are the ones to blame here, not the media. Our politicians who make crazy laws and decide they want to go after each other later on. This is about sports. Dmitry, what do you think? Can Russia ensure and promise to uh, athletes uh, like Akil Patterson uh, to gay people coming to Russia that the country will be welcoming to them, that there will be the spirit of sports competitiveness during the games? Very briefly, because we're wrapping well, up. I think, uh, you know, John, who has been directly involved in preparation for the games, he will agree with me that, believe me, athletes will not be called derogatory names. Believe me, 50,000, no, 50 billion dollars that were spent on these Olympics was not spent in vain. You will have a very warm welcome here. And I can just add to that, I, I'm afraid we lost the signal on the phone with Martin Andrews, but the very fact alone that the, the largest and the only English-speaking television channel, which is RT TV, uh, sent Martin Andrews, a gay, open gay journalist, to film the documentary about uh, Sochi Olympics, uh, says for itself. Martin, can you hear us? Yes, I can. So I think this alone sends a big message to the world. Well, the, the fact that I went to Sochi and to, fil to, to film and to see how they spent $50 billion, or do you think it was the fact that I was, they sent a gay journalist? <laughs> no, we were just saying that, of course, we hope there'll be the spirit of competitiveness. Uh, during the Sochi Olympics, and uh, everyone will be welcome, no matter no, what their I, sexual I, I, orientation would be. Year, having lived in Russia for eight years, uh, I think that Russians are actually the most misunderstood people in the world, uh, and I, I, I can only hope that next year that they will open anybody with open arms, uh, having experienced um, Russian hospitality in its greatest form. I think anybody next year will have a wonderful, wonderful time when participating in the Sochi Olympics. Thank you very much. This was Martin Andrews uh, on the phone with us here in the studio. We had John Helovic, uh, Dmitry Babic, and uh, in London with us was John Goodbody, Sunday Times sports correspondent. T taking part in our discussion panel from Washington was Akil Patterson, a member of the Athlete Ally Advisory Board. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for taking part in this discussion, and uh, welcome to the Sochi Winter Olympics Thank you in for less having than us. half a year from now. Thank you. Thank you.